I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day until the day I Sean Michael Carroll is a theoretical physicist specializing in quantum mechanics, gravity, and cosmology. He's a research professor in the Department of Physics at the California Institute of Technology. He has been a contributor to the physics blog Cosmic Variance and has published in scientific journals such as Nature as well as other publications including the New York Times, Sky and Telescope, and New Scientist among many, many others. Uh, he has appeared on the History Channels, the Universe, Science Channels, Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, Closer to Truth, uh, and Comedy Central's The Colbert Report. Uh, he is the author of Space, Time, and Geometry, a graduate-level textbook in general relativity, and has also recorded lectures for the great courses on cosmology, the physics of time, and the Higgs boson. He is also the author of three popular books, four, now, four popular books. Uh, Stupid Wikipedia, uh, uh, which include From Eternity to Here on the Higgs boson, uh, The Particle at the End of the Universe, and One on Science and Philosophy entitled The Big Picture on the Origins of Life, Meaning, and the Universe Itself. And of course, we are here to talk about something deeply hidden. Please join me in welcoming the celebrated Dr. Carroll. <coughs> Thank you very much, and thanks everyone for coming out on Friday night, and thanks to the West Portal Bookstore and Wonderfest. Truth is a great flirt. I kind of like that. It's a good, it's a good motto. Can you hear me in the back? Am I being amplified correctly? All right, very, very good. Uh, so I've written a book. It's about quantum mechanics, and the last thing the world needs is a book about quantum mechanics, another book about quantum mechanics. I'm sure there's half a dozen other books about quantum mechanics on the shelves of this bookstore right here. But I also think there's a reason why another book was needed, that I'm doing something a little bit different than other books do. Ordinarily, in books about quantum mechanics, what they try to convince you of is that quantum mechanics is so weird and mysterious and impossible to understand that you can just stand in awe of it. You don't actually try to understand what it is saying. My own attitude is very different. Quantum mechanics, if you know a little bit about it, which you probably do if you're here in the room, I mean, you might be coming out of the heat, I understand, but uh, <laughs> it's the theory that we seem to need to invoke when we talk about very tiny things, atoms and subatomic particles and so forth. It applies to the whole universe, but it really shows up at the very smallest scales. You need quantum mechanics to make sense of uh, how lasers work, how transistors work, why the sun shines, why this table is solid rather than collapsing relies on quantum mechanics. It is absolutely at the center of all of modern physics. Basically, in the history of physics, there have been two successful paradigms or frameworks for doing physics. There was classical mechanics, which we got from Isaac Newton in the 1600s, and there's been quantum mechanics, and that's it. That's how important it is. At the same time, as my illustrious Caltech predecessor, Richard Feynman, would once say, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. You're going to dim the lights, okay. It's quantum mechanics that explains why there are lights in this room. Let me tell you that. Um, <clears throat> this seems strange. What do you mean we don't understand quantum mechanics? We use it to make predictions to enormously good precision. Like I said, we use it to explain what's going on in computers and so forth. How in the world can it be that we don't understand it? So what we have from quantum mechanics is, that's a little too dim. Is there a, is there a lesser level of dimness that we could do? It always uh, affects the speaker when they see people fall asleep during their talk. <laughs> anyway, um, the truth is what we can do with quantum mechanics is use it to make predictions. But if you ask a physicist what is really going on when we make that prediction, they will tell you they don't know. Many of them will say, I don't even want to know. The job of a physicist isn't to understand nature, it's just to make predictions. Why would you ever think otherwise? I think that is a terrible, terrible attitude, and it's grown up over the course of the 20th century. We put quantum mechanics together in the early years of the 20th century, and then for whatever reason, and we decided that all we would do is use it rather than try to understand what it actually said. You should think that understanding quantum mechanics should be the highest priority, highest status subdiscipline within all of physics, right? That people who try to understand quantum mechanics should be the 
big superstars of theoretical physics who get the best salaries and so forth. But instead, if you say to your graduate thesis advisor, I want to understand quantum mechanics, they will fire you. Or they will at least say, don't do that, do something useful and interesting and important. So the analogy I like to use is Aesop's fable of the fox and the grapes. Remember this one? The fox sees some grapes up there, says, oh, those grapes look good, I'm going to go get them. Jumps up, but they're just too high and the fox can't reach the grapes. So the fox decides, you know what, I never wanted those grapes anyway. They're probably sour, okay? In case you're wondering, physicists are represented by the fox. And understanding quantum mechanics is, is represented by the grape. So physicists would have liked to understand quantum mechanics, but they haven't. And so now they've convinced themselves they never wanted to. And I think that's kind of a tragedy. So to explain why I think that it is understandable, let me go very quickly through not quite the history of quantum mechanics, but a, a set of reasons why you might have come across quantum mechanics. So like I said, the early years of the 20th century, we were trying to understand atoms. This is a picture of an atom, a little cartoon. I'm sure you've seen things like this before. This is what's called the Rutherford atom, after Ernest Rutherford. Before that, we had the plum pudding atom, which thought that maybe little electrons, negatively charged particles, were swimming in this big pudding-like thing. But instead, the electrons are orbiting, according to the Rutherford atom, a tiny concentration of mass called the nucleus, which we now know is made of protons and neutrons. The problem with this is that it can't possibly be right under the rules of classical mechanics, which were the only rules we had in 1909. Classical mechanics says something very specific about what happens when you take a charged particle, like an electron, and you move it. You move it around in circles or jiggle it up and down. Namely, this electron has an electric field coming out of it, so if you jiggle it, that electric field jiggles, and waves propagate outward in both the electric and magnetic fields. We call those waves light. All the light here in the room is produced by electrons jiggling up and down. So what should happen in the Rutherford atom is that those electrons zooming around in circles should be emitting light. And because of that, they should be losing energy. And because of that, they should be spiraling into the center of the nucleus. And the electrons shouldn't orbit like little planets in the solar system. They should fall into the middle, and you can calculate how quickly. It's something like 10 to the minus 11 seconds. So we can, you're made of atoms. We can do the experiment right now. Let's see if you last. Yes, you did. More than 10 to the minus 11 seconds. <laughs> there is something wrong about this picture of the atom. And of course, people tried to change up the picture of the atom, but eventually they realized something much more profound was going on. And it's, it's taken us a while to really let it sink in exactly how profound it is. The thing that is going wrong with this picture is that the electron is not a little point-like particle that orbits around the nucleus. That picture is just wrong. Rather, you should think of the electron as a wave. You know, in, back in the day, we always argued about whether light was a wave or a particle. It has both aspects. So in the early 20th century, people had the bright idea, well, maybe electrons, which seem like particles, are actually kind of wave-like. And they invented the brilliant term wave function to describe what that is. That's sarcasm. It's not a brilliant term at all. It's an incredibly boring term for a very, very important thing. What if the electron is not a little point that orbits around? What if it is a cloud? What if it's a wave that settles into different shapes in the vicinity of the nucleus? And these little pictures here are, they're not photographs, but they're mathematical representations of the different shapes that the electron's wave function can take in the orbit around the nucleus of an atom. So the reason why electrons don't spiral into the center of a nucleus is because electrons are not particles. Electrons are described by wave functions, and you solve the equations to figure out what are the individual different states of energy that the wave function can have. And the answer is a set of discrete possibilities. Here are some of the possibilities. And you might, they might cause flashbacks from your chemistry courses, right? If you look, learn about p orbitals and things like that. These are the different shapes that an electron wave function can have, okay? So the idea that electrons are not particles but are described by wave functions helps us understand the stability of matter. Why doesn't everything just collapse to the middle? It's even better than that because we can invent an equation that is solved by all these wave functions. And I 
went to the effort of actually putting the equation on the board because you need to remember this equation for the quiz that will be handed out at the end of the talk. I just got louder. Is that okay? Is that bad? Good? Um, good. So this is Erwin Schrodinger in the bow tie over here. He is the guy who wrote Schrodinger's equation. And the details of the equation don't matter. What they say very roughly, what it says is, on the left, it's asking the question, how much energy is being described by this particular wave function? And on the right, it's saying, how quickly does the wave function change over time? What is its rate of change? So roughly speaking, parts of the wave function that are very high energy change very quickly. Those that are low energy change very slowly. It makes sense. But what really matters is there is an equation. So then it's science. It's not just a set of suggestions about what can happen. You can make predictions. You can torture your undergraduate students asking them to solve this equation again and again and again. And this is really quantum mechanics in its mature form. Rather than particles moving around in orbits, you have wave functions. The wave functions like this are represented by this letter psi. And there is the equation that they obey. This clearly can't be the whole picture, it would appear, because when you look at electrons, you see things like this. This is an image of a little chunk of uranium, which is a radioactive element, put into a cloud chamber. So what it means to say that uranium is radioactive is it emits charged particles, and what it means to say it's in a cloud chamber is a charged particle moving through the chamber ionizes a little set of particles, and you can see them as these little streaks. So you could solve the Schrodinger equation, and you could ask yourself, what should be emitted when an electron is emitted from a radioactive source like uranium? And the answer is it should be a spherical density of wave function. It should be completely symmetric, or at least mostly symmetric. But what you see is a line. What you see is exactly like the uranium has emitted a particle. But I thought we just said that electrons are in particles, they're waves. So what is going on? It seems like, it seems almost as if, the electrons are doing one thing when we're not looking at them. They're just sitting happily inside the atom. And then they do another thing when we observe them. They look like they're particles. That sounds crazy. How can we do better? So the physicists of 1927 decided, we can't do better. We should just be crazy. So they resolved this dilemma by saying that wave functions act differently whether you are or are not looking at them. <laughs> when you're not looking at them, it's, it's spread out. On the left, you have a picture, a mathematical plot of what a particular wave function might look like for an electron. But then when you look at them, you never see that kind of spread out wave function. What you see is the electron is located at a point like you would expect for a particle. And the way, that you the way that you relate the first picture to the second is that you can't predict with certainty where you're going to see the electron. All you can do is predict the probability that you will see it in different places. And the probability is greater where the original wave function is greater. In fact, the probability is given by that original wave function squared. So you might see it anywhere, but it's more likely that you will see it at the peak of that wave function. So this is literally, you think I'm joking, this is literally what we teach our students when we teach them quantum mechanics as undergraduates. We say there are two separate sets of rules in quantum mechanics. There's the rules when you're looking and the rules when you're not looking. When you're not looking at a quantum system, it's described by a wave function and it obeys the Schrodinger equation. It's exactly parallel to classical mechanics where you could have an electromagnetic wave or a set of points or whatever classical system you wanted. It would be described by a classical state, and it would obey Newton's laws of motion. In quantum mechanics, we have wave functions that obey the Schrodinger equation. It's exactly that paradigm. But then there's these extra rules for what you get when you look at them. You don't see what it was before you looked at it. The wave function collapses. There's a probability for getting different possible answers. And this has been enshrined as the Copenhagen interpretation. If you're being a little bit more careful, you don't want to call it that because people disagree about what the people in Copenhagen really thought. So it's safer just to call it the textbook interpretation because it is what we teach our students, okay? The problem with this is this clearly crazy talk. This is manifestly unacceptable as a fundamental theory of nature. Words like observe should not appear in a fundamental theory of nature. That's just not how physics generally works. Let me highlight two of the problems 
that this textbook formulation has. One is what we might call the ontology problem. Ontology is a fancy word used by philosophers. It's the study of being. So we use it to represent what reality actually is, okay? In classical mechanics, reality is a bunch of particles with positions and velocities. Here we're saying the wave function represents what an electron is doing, but I didn't quite say the electron is a wave function. Why did I not quite say that? Because we don't know. We physicists who are highly trained to think about this stuff won't quite tell you what the electron actually is. Is the wave function a precise and complete representation of reality? Or is it a partial representation of reality? People like Einstein thought that there were wave functions, but there were also actual point particles. There are so-called hidden variables. There's both particles and waves. Or does the wave function have nothing to do with reality at all? Is it just a cookbook for predicting the probability of getting different answers? There are real, honest-to-goodness working physicists who believe all of these different possibilities, even though it's many years since quantum mechanics was invented. And then there is the measurement problem. So, like I said, the words observe or look at seem to appear in the fundamental rules of quantum mechanics. But I haven't told you what those words mean. I mean, you kind of know what they mean, but the fundamental laws of nature should be a little bit more precise than kind of knowing what you mean, right? Does it need to be a human being looking at something? What if an earthworm looks at something? What if a video camera looks at something? What if I just glance at it slightly? What if it's like behind the corner or something like that? Does that count as observing? Clearly, you either need to precisify these words or you need to get rid of them entirely. We should be trying to do better. These problems are why Feynman said nobody understands quantum mechanics. They don't get in the way of making predictions, but they very much get in the way of saying why anything is happening the way it's happening. So, there are actually more than one very sensible proposals for how to answer these questions. I'm not going to be fair and talk about all of them. I'm only going to talk about my favorite one, which is proposed by Hugh Everett when he was a graduate student in the 1950s. And basically, he offered the physics community a bit of quantum therapy. The entirety of Everett's suggestion is, chill out. You're thinking too hard. You're working too hard, you're bending over backwards to try to fit your experimental data. You don't need to do that. What is the simplest, dumbest, most straightforward, stripped down, pure, austere version of quantum mechanics you could imagine? Wave functions are reality. There's nothing else, there's nothing else we need to try to describe, because we know that every version of quantum mechanics needs wave functions, so not needing anything else is the simplest thing we could do. And they always obey the Schrodinger equation. They don't obey it sometimes, and other times they spontaneously collapse. We know that wave functions sometimes obey the Schrodinger equation, so let's say that they always do. That is a very, very simple version of quantum mechanics, right? So let's compare it with the Copenhagen interpretation. There is only one set of rules, according to Everett. They always apply, and this just says there are wave functions, and they, they evolve smoothly according to the Schrodinger equation. Clearly, this is a much simpler set of rules. Clearly, this is easier to learn. Clearly, all the words are well-defined here. So why in the world don't we just accept this right away? Well, the answer is those little streaks that we saw coming out of the uranium. When we look at simple wave functions, they don't look like they're spread out. It doesn't look like the particle is obeying the Schrodinger equation when we observe it. And whatever did is explain why you just really need to think about what you meant by looking at it, and everything suddenly makes sense. The secret ingredient is actually uh, not something that Everett invented, but was invented by Einstein. Einstein gets a terrible reputation in quantum circles. You're told that by the time quantum mechanics was coming around, he was too stuffy and old to really keep up, but he never quite accepted it because he was sort of stubborn. All of that is utter nonsense. Einstein understood quantum mechanics as well as anyone, and he made fundamental contributions to it. One of them was stressing the importance of this phenomenon called entanglement. So let me explain what that means. If you have different things in the universe, according to classical mechanics, right, the table, the book, the water, etc., you describe them each with their state, 
In this case, if it's classical mechanics, the position and the velocity. So you might think that in quantum mechanics, everything has its own wave function. This electron has a wave function, that electron has a wave function, this neutron does, etc. But no, that is not actually how quantum mechanics works. And the reason why is a combination of the need to get these probabilistic predictions plus the need to do certain things where you conserve things like energy or momentum or spin. So let's concentrate on spin. This is the Higgs boson, one of my favorite particles. It was just detected in uh, Geneva in 2012 for the first time. I like the Higgs boson, among other reasons, because it's the only fundamental particle we know about that has zero spin. It's just sitting there. So all elementary particles can potentially have a quantity called spin, which is just like the rotation of a top or the rotation of the Earth, but just at an elementary particle level. The electron, for example, has spin that is either clockwise or counterclockwise, which we cleverly call spin up or spin down. Those are the only two possibilities. So a Higgs boson can decay in about one zeptosecond, it will decay, let's say into two electrons. That's a little bit of a cheat because you do conserve electric charge, so really you could you decay, if you're the Higgs, into one electron and one anti-electron or positron, but let's just keep our lives easier by saying two electrons. We'll ignore the charge, but we'll keep track of the spin. So the electrons have to be spinning. The Higgs boson had zero spin, so it's very clear that those electrons, even though we don't know which way either one of them will be spinning, they had better be spinning in opposite directions, because the spin had better cancel out to give you zero, which is what we started with. So, in other words, when the Higgs decays, it can decay into electron one is spin down, electron two is spin up, or electron one is spin up and electron two is spin down. It can't decay into they're both up or they're both down. But we don't know which of the first two allowed possibilities it will decay into. And this is quantum mechanics. This is not our ignorance at work here. It's not that we don't know. It's that the Higgs boson will actually decay into a superposition, as we say, of both. So it's not that it's one or the other we just don't know. The state, the wave function of the two electrons is a combination of electron one is up, two is down, and electron one is down, two is up. So what you see here is that if you were to observe one of these electrons, if you were to observe electron number one, you don't know if it's going to be spin up or spin down. If you observe electron two, you don't know if it's going to be spin up or spin down, but you know they're opposite. So if you observe electron one and see that it's spin up, suddenly you know that electron two is spin down, even if they're light years apart from each other. This is what bugged Albert Einstein and let him complain, fetch, if you like, about spooky action at a distance. And that's one of the things we'd like to understand. So this idea of entanglement, of the state of particle one and particle two being related to each other in this way, is so important that I would say exactly the same thing again on another slide. You don't, in quantum mechanics, describe different pieces of the universe with their individual wave functions. There is only one wave function for the combined system, whatever it called the universal wave function, which we now often call the wave function of the universe. So you might think with two electrons, you have a wave function for one that is either spin up or spin down, a superposition of both, likewise for wave function two, but that's not right. You only have one wave function for the two electron system that is a superposition of, they're both in opposite directions, but we don't know which one. So the whole thing is not just for two electrons, right? What I'm saying when I say the wave function of the universe, I really mean that. There is only one wave function for literally the entire universe. Sometimes we're lucky enough that you can sort of isolate a system and talk about its wave function. But strictly speaking, the rules of quantum mechanics say there's only one wave function for everything. With that in mind, let's turn to the thought experiment stylings of Erwin Schrodinger, who famously put a cat in a box and did terrible, terrible things to it. In fact, Schrodinger's daughter once said, I think my father just didn't like cats. <laughs> so we're going to modify Schrodinger's thought experiment a little bit. The famous experiment is there's a box, sealed box, you can't see inside until you open up the top. There is a radioactive source with a detector like a Geiger counter that will click if the radioactive source decays, and if it does click, it will lift up 
the lid of a smaller box and release a vial of gas, okay? In Schrodinger's thought experiment, it was cyanide gas. In my version, it is sleeping gas, okay? <laughs> So in Schrodinger's version, there is quantum uncertainty so that the radioactive source evolves into a superposition of I've decayed and I've not decayed. And the whole point of the experiment is to magnify that superposition from something microscopic to something macroscopic. So when the detector looks for the decay in the source, it will evolve into a superposition of I've noticed the, de 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 the decay or I haven't. So it's not that we don't know which one is true, it is a superposition of both. The gas is in a superposition of having left its vial and having stayed in its vial. So the cat, according to Schrodinger, is in a superposition of an awake cat and a sleep cat, since it's sleeping gas out there. So it's a happy little sleeping cat there. In the <laughs> now, Schrodinger didn't invent this experiment in order to say, isn't quantum mechanics weird and fun? He's invented this thought experiment, which he did, by the way, in, in uh, correspondence with Einstein, because he wanted to say, surely you don't believe this. <laughs> Schrodinger invented the equation, but the interpretation of the equation as a wave function that you use to make probabilities when you measure things, and before you measure them, everything is in a superposition, he never liked that. Many of the founders of quantum mechanics never really liked how it turned out. So the point is to draw the distinction between your classical intuition and your quantum intuition. Classically, it's easy to say the cat is awake or the cat is asleep. Maybe I don't know which, and I will assign a probability to being either one. The quantum mechanics is saying something different. Quantum mechanics is saying that the cat can be in a superposition of both at the same time. And then what you want to do is say, well, what if I open the box and look at it? So there's a story to be told about that in the textbook or Copenhagen version, which says the observer, who in this case is played by Niels Bohr, founder of the Copenhagen interpretation, you should treat the observer in the textbook interpretation as classical. So I'm putting the observer in square brackets. Classical things are in square brackets, quantum things are in parentheses. So the cat is quantum mechanical, but the observer is classical. And you start the experiment with the cat is in a superposition of awake and asleep, and the observer has not yet opened the box. The observer opens the box, does a measurement, and the wave function of the cat collapses. So either there's a cat that's awake and the observer saw the cat awake, or the cat is asleep and the observer saw the cat asleep. This is what we teach our students, and if they mouth off, we give them extra homework to stop them from asking questions. <laughs> So Everett tells a totally different story, because he says there's no such thing as wave functions collapsing, and there's also no such thing as a classical world. His major insight, why he called it the theory of the universal wave function, was that even observers are quantum systems when you come right down to it. And that makes sense, even though we experience the classical laws of physics as very good approximations, we're all made of atoms and molecules, which certainly are quantum systems themselves. So you treat both the cat and the observer as quantum. There's Hugh Everett being the observer here. They both have a wave function. And the point is that if you just ask what the Schrodinger equation predicts when the observer opens the box and looks at the cat, the answer is the state of the observer becomes entangled with the state of the cat. So you open the box, you measure, and rather than one or the other, you get a superposition of both. The wave function of the universe evolves into a superposition of the cat was awake and the observer saw the cat awake, plus the cat was asleep and the observer saw the cat asleep. Everyone in the world agrees this is what the Schrodinger equation predicts. The problem is there are plenty of people who have measured quantum systems over the course of history. There's never been a person who said, I feel like I was in a superposition. I feel like I saw the cat awake and the cat asleep, or I saw the electron spin up and the electron spin down. Our personal human experience is always that of getting definite outcomes for these measurements. So the reason why Everett's theory, even though it's very simple and pure and austere, isn't obviously right is because it doesn't seem, at first glance, to comport with what we actually see when we do these experiments. 
That's the puzzle. We don't ever feel like we're in a superposition. Interestingly, I don't think Everett actually himself had any right to be so correct about the interpretation of quantum mechanics, because this puzzle, why don't you think you're in a superposition, really wasn't adequately solved until the 1970s, when we invented this idea called decoherence. Remember, I told you there's only one wave function for the entire universe, but then I wrote down the wave function for a cat and observer. Really, I should include the entire rest of the universe, right, if I'm being a little bit more honest. And usually we tell ourselves, well, it doesn't matter, but maybe it does. So by the rest of the universe, we call it in physics the environment. I mean all the stuff that we're not keeping track of in our experiment, right? So even if I look at you and see where you are and what you're doing, I'm not keeping track of every individual particle of air or light photon or anything like that. Those are all in the environment. <coughs> so the environment is in the box along with the cat. There's photons and air molecules and so forth. So if I write the wave function for cat, environment, and observer, the first thing that happens is the cat becomes entangled with the environment. That's the process of decoherence. Decoherence is whenever a quantum system in superposition becomes entangled with the wider world, the environment in particular. And then the observer can open the box. That's what you call measurement. And then you get the superposition of the cat's awake, the environment measured the cat to be awake, the observer saw the cat awake, plus cat's asleep, etc. Okay? This final line looks very similar to the line I had on the previous slide, except I added the environment in there. What difference does that make? The difference it makes is that you can now ask if I changed one of those terms in the superposition a little bit, what effect would it have on the other one? And the answer is none at all. Because the environments are completely different from each other, what happens in one part of that superposition is completely independent from what happens in the other part of the superposition. So measurements in Everett's theory are not magical or undefined or hard to understand. They're just quantum systems and superpositions decohering by becoming entangled with the environment. When that happens, the wave function splits it branches. These are the two branches at the bottom there. And those branches are as if they are separate worlds. They evolve forward in time completely unrelated to whatever is happening in the other branch. So what Everett says is, the reason why you don't ever feel like you're in a superposition is because you're not the combination of both of those people in the bottom line. You are one or the other. But there is another one. If you saw the cat awake, and you listen to the Schrodinger equation, and you chill out and accept what the Schrodinger equation says, what it says is there is also a person who saw the cat asleep. They're in a different part of the wave function, and we call that a different world. So Everett wrote his paper, and he titled it the Relative State Formulation of Quantum Mechanics. Not a very sexy title. It was completely ignored by the physics community. It wasn't until 1970 that Bryce DeWitt dubbed it the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, and then people got a little bit interested. Often they got interested in sort of a negative way, but the point here is, if you follow it along, at no point did I add worlds to quantum mechanics. All we did was listen to what quantum mechanics was telling us all along. The worlds were always there. All other attempts to understand the formulation of quantum mechanics, whether it's the Copenhagen interpretation or various other alternatives, they go to extra effort to get rid of the other worlds. And maybe that's worth it, but the other worlds aren't bothering you. You don't ever feel them. You can't talk to them, okay? Just let them be there. It's much simpler. You just have to, like, admit that it's okay. Breathe. It's all right. There are a lot of questions that come up when you think about the many worlds theory or the Everett interpretation. Okay, so some of them I think are worth diving into. I'll dive into one in particular, but a couple I just want to like quickly get rid of some of the um, most obvious issues. Not because we necessarily know the answers, but because uh, they don't bother us that much. Let's put it that way. So one question is, how many worlds are there anyway? And the answer is there are a lot. There are a lot of worlds. Okay, so in your body, 
In a typical human-sized body, a radioactive decay happens about 5,000 times a second. So the minimum number of splittings of the universe are 5,000, just because of the radioactive materials going on in the human body. That doesn't mean that you've made 5,000 worlds. That means you've made 2 to the 5,000 worlds, 2 to the power of 5,000, a crazy big number, okay? There's only uh, 10 to the 80th particles in the observable universe, particles of, of matter. So there could very well be an infinite number of worlds. We honestly don't know. This is one of the embarrassing things about the state of quantum mechanics. We haven't tried as hard as we could to understand it. So even the most basic question, like are there a finite or infinite number of worlds, we don't know the answer to. We do know the answer to questions like, well, where does the energy come from to make all these worlds? There seems to be a lot of stuff in our world. There's a lot of stuff in this room. If you duplicate it, that seems to cost energy. But it's a, that's just because that's not quite the right way to think about it. I mean, after all, quantum mechanics in general, many worlds in particular, is very far from our everyday experience. We really need to sort of recalibrate our intuition a little bit. The Schrodinger equation, pushing along a wave function, conserves energy perfectly 100%. So there's no question that energy conservation is violated according to Everett. All the Everett interpretation ever says is there are wave functions and they obey the Schrodinger equation. How you should think about it is that there's a thickness to the world, and that thickness has to do with the size of the wave function describing that world. And what happens is not that it duplicates all the time, but that it splits. You saw that happening in the actual equations here. One world split into two. And what that means is the worlds become thinner. Again, if you're inside, you don't notice. It's a whole world as far as you're concerned. But their contributions to the total energy of the universe get smaller and smaller. There's a couple of other e easily answered questions. One is, I just don't like it because there's too many universes out there. It's sort of a, an existential worry, right? Like, where are you going to put them all? So again, the number of universes is, the number of possible universes is no different in many worlds than it ever was in any other version of quantum mechanics. Every version of quantum mechanics thinks that an electron can be in a superposition of spin up and spin down. And if you believe that, then you should believe that a person can be in a superposition of having observed spin up and having observed spin down. And if you believe that, there's no problem believing that the universe can be in a superposition. It's just the formalism of quantum mechanics that lets you do this. Nothing special about the Everett interpretation. The other question is, can you test this theory, right? There's this idea from Karl Popper that a scientific theory should be falsifiable. Not that it should be false, that would be bad, but that in principle we could imagine an experimental result that would convince us that the theory was wrong. And if you say, look, there's all these other worlds out there, but I can never see them, there's a worry, since I can never see them, that I can never test or falsify the theory. But remember, the theory is not the worlds. The worlds are a prediction that the theory makes. The theory is... The universe is described by a wave function, and that wave function obeys the Schrodinger equation. That is not the theory that you get an alternative to many worlds. So, for example, all you would have to do is to measure a quantum system whose wave function did not obey the Schrodinger equation, and you would instantly falsify the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. And indeed, in other inter some other interpretations, that's what happens, and people are doing the experiment. If you get a tiny little uh, collection of atoms and cool them down close to absolute zero, if one of them suddenly jiggles in a way that is not described by the Schrodinger equation, the whole thing will heat up a little bit. That would falsify Everett. Karl Popper himself was a fan of the Everett interpretation. So it's a perfectly good scientific theory. And let me mention two questions that I think are harder and we're still working on. One I'll just mention very briefly, which is the probability issue. Remember, when we were doing the textbook version of quantum mechanics, one of the postulates of the theory was that we get different answers to quantum experiments with a probability given by the wave function squared. In the postulates for Everett, the word probability never appears, right? The Schrodinger equation is perfectly deterministic. 
If you know the wave function of the universe at one moment in time, you know it with perfect accuracy at all other times. There's no chanciness or stochasticity or randomness. So how in the world do we expect to retrieve the empirical fact that probabilities seem to be given by the wave function squared? The answer is this idea called self-locating uncertainty. Even if you know the wave function of the universe exactly, there still can be something you don't know, which is where you are in it. Remember, here is our cat, our environment, and our observer. Decoherence happens before you personally experience the outcome of the measurement. The wave function branches before you know it, okay? Because the photons in the room and so forth interact with that cat way faster than any action you can possibly take. So in this little period, in between decoherence and your actual knowledge of the measurement outcome, there are now two branches of the wave function. There are two copies of you, but those two copies are exactly identical. And neither one of them knows which branch of the wave function they're on. So even if they know the wave function of the universe, they know the complete quantum state of all of reality, there's still something they're ignorant about, where they are in it, which branch they're on. And then you can ask, is there a sensible, rational way to assign probabilities to being on one branch or the other? And you go through the math, and the answer is yes, and it's exactly the probability is given by the wave function squared. So you can get, rather than postulating this idea that probabilities are given by the wave function squared, in effort you can derive it. That's better than just making it a separate axiom of your theory. Okay, let me dwell in the, in the last couple of minutes of the talk. I really want to dig in a little bit with my favorite open question in Everettian quantum mechanics, which is why the world looks at all classical. Like in most other alternative versions of quantum mechanics, the classical world or some shadow of the classical world is put in by hand, okay? There's only certain things you can observe or something like that. Everett is just wave functions all the way down. And yet, here we are in a world where things look pretty solid and classical. They don't look all that wavy. Einstein asked a friend of his, do you really think the moon isn't there when you're not looking at it? We think it is. But why can we predict the position of the moon millions of years in the past and future using Newton's laws, even if quantum mechanics is the fundamental rule? So, the interesting thing here is, that even if you're a highly trained physicist and you've taken quantum mechanics courses and you've assigned problems to your students and so forth, all of us still privilege the classical viewpoint. So when someone says something like, you know, a very successful part of quantum mechanics is quantum electromagnetism, quantum electrodynamics, QED. But you still start with the classical theory, classical electromagnetism, and you quantize it, right? So you start with some classical stuff, cats, grass, people, and then you invent a quantum mechanical theory based on that classical description, and this process is called quantization. And what you get at the end of that is a wave function, which mathematically is a vector. It's a vector in an abstract sense, so I drew a little three-dimensional vector space here, but the actual vector space that wave functions live in is plausibly infinite dimensional. It's a very, very big vector space, but mathematically that's what it is, okay? And the problem with this, or at least the worrisome thing you should keep in mind, is that nature doesn't do this. Reality doesn't start with a classical system and quantize it. Nature is quantum from the start. So what you should be able to do, if you thought you understood quantum mechanics, is start with some abstract vector and extract from it, oh look, there are cats and leaves and people. Almost no one has actually tried to do this until very recently, so we're just beginning to learn how to do it. The other part, of classical reality is the existence of space itself, right? There's stuff as a location in space. That's something that should somehow emerge from the wave function, the very existence of the three-dimensional reality around us. Something we know about three-dimensional reality is from Einstein, is that it's part of four-dimensional space-time, and that space-time is curved. The curvature of space-time, according to Einstein's general relativity, is what gives rise to the force of gravity, as you and I know it. Now, there's an issue, because gravity, as described by Einstein, 
is the, is the one force of nature that we've not yet been able to successfully quantize. We do not have a quantum theory of gravity. Einstein's classical theory, general relativity, says the geometry of space is sourced by the stuff inside it. Energy, mass, momentum, things like that. But when you apply the usual rules of taking a classical theory and quantizing it to gravity, they fail. You don't get the right answer. So what I would like to boldly suggest is maybe these problems cancel each other out. The problems that we don't understand quantum gravity and we don't understand quantum mechanics. I mean, why should we understand quantum gravity if we don't even claim to understand quantum mechanics? Well, the answer is all the other forces, we got away with quantizing them perfectly well. But maybe when it comes to gravity, the fact that nature doesn't start with a classical system and then quantize it is finally catching up to us. Maybe we should try to find gravity in a purely quantum mechanical description from the start, rather than quantizing gravity. Now, in this process, we're allowed to take clues from what we know the answer should be, right? The answer should be, we want a world that looks classical, three-dimensional space, etc. And most importantly, the stuff in that world is described by fields, not by particles, okay? I talked about electrons, protons, neutrons, but modern quantum field theory is really the way that physicists describe the world. You know about, the difference between a particle and a field is, a particle has a location in space, it is here, it is not anywhere else. A field is everywhere, but it has a different value everywhere. So there's the electric field, the magnetic field, the gravitational field. It might be zero, but there's still some value, even if it's zero, and it's not zero somewhere else. And modern physicists recognize that even what we know of as matter particles, electrons, neutrinos, quarks, they're all vibrations in quantum fields that spread throughout all of space, okay? So the difference between a particle and not a particle is not that it's there but not anywhere else, it's that its field is vibrating harder here rather than somewhere else. And a consequence of that is that in quantum field theory, empty space is really fascinating. In point particle theories, empty space is just a empty. There's nothing going on, there's nothing happening. But in quantum field theory, even empty space is full of all these quantum fields. By empty, all we mean is that these quantum fields are doing as little as possible. They have their minimum amount of energy, okay? We call it the vacuum state. So in par point particle theories, you have empty space with particles inside. In quantum field theory, you have fields everywhere, and the particles are just where the fields are vibrating with more energy than they would have in the vacuum. So from that perspective that everyone in field theory agrees with, there's a wonderful fact that the distance between two points in space is related to how much the fields in those points are entangled with each other, okay? You would not be surprised to hear that all these vibrating fields all throughout space are entangled with each other. They're constantly sort of bumping into each other and talking. They become entangled. And you will also not be surprised to hear that the nearby fields are highly entangled with each other. And if you go far away, they're not very entangled at all. So you could sort of use the amount of entanglement between two regions of space as a measure of the distance between the two regions of space. Maybe you can kind of see where this is going. Because I would like to extract, I would like to emerge space itself from purely quantum mechanical ideas. The distance between two points is not a quantum mechanical idea, but the entanglement between two vibrating fields is a quantum mechanical idea. So let's turn this idea around. Rather than saying, when things are closer together, they're more entangled, let's say, when they're more entangled, we will define that as closer together. The more entanglement you get, the shorter the distance between you, as far as vacuum uh, description of space-time is concerned. And it might not be that everything is quite as simple as, you know, a tabletop, Euclidean geometry. Einstein's insight for general relativity is that space-time has a curved geometry, and you can measure the curve, the curvature of space itself, if I tell you the distance between any set of two points. As long as you know the distance along any curve, you can figure out, oh, is this flat space? Is it positively curved? Is it negatively curved, etc. 
So in this picture, if you knew the entanglement between any two little bits of the quantum mechanical wave function, you would know the entire geometry of emergent space. There's a relationship between geometry and entanglement. Meanwhile, there's a relationship between entanglement and energy. Remember I told you, if there's no energy, if it's empty space, if it's the vacuum, there's a certain amount of entanglement everywhere. So you can ask, what happens if I add energy, if I add particles, for example? Well, particles mean that you've taken some little bit of the vibrating quantum field and you've shaken it to vibrate it more. That breaks the entanglement between that little region and the rest of the stuff around it. So there's less entanglement inside a region that has particles than for a region that doesn't. So that what matters is not whether it's more or less. What matters is that there is a relationship between the amount of energy in a region and how entangled that region is with the region around it. There's a direct relationship between entanglement and energy. So you see where this is going, maybe. Entanglement is this fundamental, fundamental quantum mechanical feature that we have to work with. Unlike distance and things like that that hopefully emerge, entanglement is there. It's in the wave function. We argue that entanglement is closely related to the geometry of space because if you know the entanglement between different parts of the wave function, you can use that as a measure of their distance. And we also know that entanglement is related to the energy in some region of space. So guess what? Geometry is related to energy. But that idea that the geometry of space is related to the energy in space is just general relativity. There's some math that I'm not telling you, okay? It's a longer talk. It's another book that I wrote, but the point is that the idea that the geometry of space itself is dynamical, is not given ahead of time and fixed, but that it responds to matter and energy, and in particular the amount of energy in a region, is what Einstein posited, and from this perspective we can derive it, just like we derive the probability rule, we can derive the fact that the, space time, that the geometry of space-time should be dynamical, and it should obey an equation like what Einstein obeyed. So, to be very, very honest, all of this is incredibly speculative, premature. We don't know if any of it's on the right track. There's very different ways of thinking about the relationship of quantum mechanics and gravity. But I think it's very fascinating to me, it's promising, that by taking the foundations of quantum mechanics very, very seriously, by thinking about what quantum mechanics is, trying to understand it, we might be led to new insights into quantum gravity, which everyone has agreed for decades now is an important problem. So I'll leave you with this quote by David Deutsch, who is uh, one of the pioneers of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Despite the unrivaled empirical success of quantum theory, the very suggestion that it may be literally true as a description of nature is still greeted with cynicism, incomprehension, and even anger. I'll leave the others to you, but hopefully this talk has lowered your incomprehension when it comes to the many worlds of application of quantum mechanics. Thank you very much. I think we have time to answer a few questions, and then I guess, you know, we're at a bookstore. They will sell books, and they, you can get them signed. Yes, you have a question. Um, does space ever end, is the question. Um, I don't know that one. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows. We have not seen any end to space. Here's why it's tricky. Here's why we don't know. When you look out into space, when you look at the stars in the sky, whatever, um, it takes time for the light to get to you from a distant star. So the closest star is so far away that it takes light four years to get to us. When you look at galaxies, they're so far away, it can take millions or billions of years. So when you see a distant object in the sky, you're seeing it from a long time ago. You're not seeing what it looks like now, right? And if you keep looking into the past, we hit a limit because we hit the Big Bang. The universe sort of started, our observable universe started around 14 billion years ago. So there's a limit to how far out we can possibly see, because things that are further away, the light has just not gotten to us yet. So space could go on forever, or it could be finite, we just don't know, but we haven't seen any limit to it yet. Yes? Uh, does the many-world theory say that the uh, behavior of the 
behavior of the members will change as the local branch gets less and less over time? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It doesn't say that, no. Um, well, I mean, it says things. There are things that it says. I'll, I'll ask. Okay. So remember this picture of the universe getting you know, thinner and thinner. Within any one universe, there's literally zero that you notice about this thinning out. Okay? So it's not like you're more ghostly or less substantial or anything like that. If the total possible number of universes is finite, then you will eventually reach that number, right? And what it will look like to you is that every universe looks the same at that point. It will basically look like thermal equilibrium. We're going there. You know, the universe is emptying out. It is sort of getting emptier and emptier, but it will take literally trillions or quadrillions of years before we will be able to see more things. So it's not like a rebalance your investment portfolio kind of question. <laughs> yes? So what's interesting is what you said about quantum gravity. It's an inverse relationship from the actual atomic view, which is more gravity, more energy, and more motion. So structurally, looking at what you're saying, is that why some of the things we're seeing, like Beale's, Beale's theories, three, three suppositions, are maybe reverse of what we expect? Or, I was reading an article in the New Scientist about this. Um, you know, it's either entanglement happens because there's something observing everything at the same time, and that's why they're all connected in fashion speed of light. They did uh, uh, an actual experiment where they actually find two particles that could not have physically been entangled, connected to each other, and over a, sp a space, a, a length of space that's with the speed of light, they could not be just receiving a signal from each other. Is yeah, you know, I think there's a lot going on there, and I, I don't actually know the Beale's axioms that, that you talk about, but the idea is that, um, the idea so far is not that we're predicting that gravity is any different than we know it, right? Like the, the real thing that would make you jump up and down with joy is to be absolutely sure that what you extracted from quantum mechanics is Einstein's classical theory of general relativity. What would make you even more happy is if you got very, very close to general relativity, but a tiny deviation that you could then go test in an experiment somehow. I like general with a dark matter situation that we don't know what we Maybe. Expect. I think dark matter is just matter. I don't think dark matter is, is going to be a, a different theory of gravity. I tried that myself. You know, it doesn't really work very well. But we're, meanwhile, you know, so theorists are working to figure out what kind of gravity we can get out of quantum mechanics, but experimenters are working very hard to test gravity in all sorts of situations. So. Maybe we'll get lucky there. Is, over here? Yes. is gravity the same and um, possibly not the same in all branches of uh, many worlds? Uh, maybe in other worlds it has a quantum uh, state and um, in our world it doesn't. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, is gravity somehow different in the different branches? In many worlds, you know, many worlds is not a theory that everything happens. Many worlds is a theory that everything obeys the Schrodinger equation. And therefore, the laws of physics are exactly the same mm -hmm. in all of these branches. Let's get someone way back there. Yeah. Um, yeah. For many worlds, if there's only two branches, but they have different probabilities, what do the probabilities mean? Right? If it can only go this way and it goes that way, if it goes both ways, that's 50-50. Yeah. But if each branch is, let's say one is 1% and one is 99%, what does the probability mean? Yeah, I'm tempted to say, read my book. But this is actually, this is a very good question, actually. This is, a lot of many worlds skeptics make exactly that argument. But it turns out that if the amount of wave function associated with each branch is not equal, you cannot convince yourself that there is any way to assign probabilities, certainly not equal probabilities. Think about it this way. Let's say we made an agreement that we would measure a spin, and it could be spin up or spin down. But if we measure it to be spin up, we would measure another spin a day later, okay? So if there's just two branches, and you're tempted for your first measurement, you're tempted to assign them 50-50, because there's two of them. But then in one of those branches, you're going to branch it again. Now there are three branches. You give them one-third, one-third, one-third. That means that the probability for one branch changed dramatically when another branch did something. The only way that it can make sense and be consistent is if you use the board the, the ordinary quantum rule. Yes? So in your theory, when you say that distance is basically just a form of entanglement, does that not contradict you saying that two electrons that light years apart are entangled? Yeah, no, that's a very good point, and I might, I might have like zipped over it too quickly. When we said that 
um, distance is a form of entanglement. This is specifically for empty space. Okay? Almost all of the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom, as we call them, in any system that you know about, whether it's like here in this room or the center of the sun, they're mostly in their vacuum state. It's mostly empty space. So particles are something extra that can have entanglement that does not depend on distance in any way. Yeah? Well, maybe that question is related to that. Since entanglement has all these interesting properties, is there a way we can make tons of entangled particles and then do something cool with them? <laughs> well, you know, so the question is, since entanglement has all these interesting properties, uh, can we make a bunch of entangled particles and then do something cool with them? On the one hand, yes, like build a computer. That's what we try to do. In a quantum computer, it is absolutely crucial that the different qubits, as we call them, quantum mechanical bits, are entangled with each other. On the other hand, it really depends on what you mean by the word bunch. Uh, these days, you can entangle, you know, in a quantum computer, dozens of qubits. But there's, you know, 10 to the 25 particles in a macroscopic object, and entangling all of them at the same time is well beyond our capability because they keep getting disturbed and decohered by the environment around them. But there are solutions yes. In the yes. Uh, is, the, to this, uh, is the special theory of relativity still valid? And uh, the reason I'm asking that is, uh, uh, let's say uh, an event happens and it branches the wave function. Uh, from a quantum information perspective, how does that information propagate very quickly throughout the universal wave function? Good. So the question is, is special relativity still valid? And in particular, let me re-ask the question in a slightly different way. When I do this branching, when I make a measurement, should I think of the branching of the universe into two possibilities happening simultaneously all throughout space? Or is it somehow confined to the inside of a little cone that grows at the speed of light? And the answer is, either way, whatever you like. Because, I mean, this is an important philosophical point, but we didn't get into it really, but what exists in Everettian quantum theory is the wave function. Or rather, what exists is the universe, which is isomorphic to the wave function. All else is commentary. So when we talk about the wave function and we break it up into branches, that's because it's convenient for us to do so. Because it's much simpler to describe the universe branch by branch. So if there's one or more different ways of dividing the universe into branches that are more or less convenient for us, then go nuts, you know? Keep yourself happy. That's perfectly fine. It's not like an objective physical fact. Yes? Maybe so I can relate it to your point. Uh, when we talk of universe splitting, we're not talking about just the observable universe, right? It's the entire multiverse. I'm talking about the whole thing. Yep. Who's next? Uh, yeah, you're right. I have the impression from your talk and from your forward that um, too many physicists um, just buy into the Copenhagen interpretation and not enough resource and money is being spent on really, really understanding what's going on. If, if all of a sudden a significant portion of the federal budget was going to be spent on that, how would we spend the money? Yeah, you know, I mean, um, Lamborghinis. <laughs> no, it's not, you know, it's, this is the, this is a feature, not a bug, of working quantum foundations, is that it's cheap. The immediate demand is not for really expensive new lab equipment, it's just for, like, hiring some people into tenured positions in universities who actually want to study this, right? Um, it's way cheaper than experimental particle physics or astrophysics or whatever. It's the same exact cost as a humanities professor or, you know, a mathematician or something like that. We need people to think about this. So you don't, like, if people wanted to spend a substantial fraction of the federal budget on the foundations of quantum mechanics, even I would be appalled. <laughs> yes? It's already a DARPA challenge up to uh, Hi. Do, does time pop out of the the little triangle that you had up there on the last slide? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, the question is, does time pop out somehow? The question of whether or not time is emergent or fundamental is a tricky one, which I did not address. You know, if you remember the Schrodinger equation, if you remember it, time is right there. It's the letter T, right? Space is nowhere there. Unlike relativity, the fundamental equation of quantum mechanics treats time and space differently. So I talked about the emergence and the geometry of space, but not so much the emergence of time. There's a whole separate discussion to be had 
on whether or not time can emerge, and people do talk about that, and guess what? Entanglement plays a crucial role in it, but it's completely separate from the discussion of space or gravity. Yes? When you're talking about uh, 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 quantum gravity, you say that we've been going at it backwards, that we start with classical and then try to quantize it, and that's been a problem. But then you said that uh, with QED, all these successful understandings of forces, we've done it classical and quantized. Yeah. Why would gravity be different than the other forces? Like, Why would we have such, such success with those forces going on? No, this is an excellent question. I mean, there's sort of two answers that I could give depending on uh, how we're feeling this day. I mean, one answer is we just got lucky with all the other forces. They don't, they didn't have to be uh, so easy to start with a classical model and quantize it. The other is that there is something special about space-time itself, right? I mean, this is why general relativity, you might have heard the motto, the general relativity says that gravity is not a force at all because it is a feature of space-time. The other forces are on top of space-time. And so, if there were one force that would be hard to quantize in the usual naive way, you might have guessed it would have been gravity. And that's what's working out. Okay, I have a lot of books to sign, so I'm going to answer two more questions. You've been very patient. Uh, so I'm curious about Bohr's rule. And, like, is there a kind of consensus nowadays on how we get it out of quantum mechanics, or is it tacked on separately? And does it have to do with the kind of consciousness to now we measure observers? Good. So the question is, it's actually the Born rule. There's a Born. separate physicist named Max Born, who is not Niels Bohr, who invented the rule that the probability is the wave function squared. Um, there's no consensus on what it, where it comes from. And it is typically just tacked on uh, in most textbook interpretations. It is, it is just given as one of the postulates of the theory. Okay. And one more question way back there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, say it again? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the sad things. As much as I love the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, I can't see the other worlds. It's very possible there are things that were very, very different going on at different times. We, we just don't know. Weren't they entangled, uh, uh, according to one theory, at the very early universe, uh, the many, according to Everett? The early universe was very unentangled. But if they were to split off from a single point, uh, 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 wouldn't they be entangled? This is a longer time? conversation than I'm going to, you know, buy a book and, and ask me what <laughs> happens. <laughs> so I, I was trying to, pick, trying to call you for the last question, so go ahead. Yes, with the headphones. Uh, what happens to the worlds when there are no observers? Yeah, they're fine. The worlds with no <laughs> observers. The world doesn't need observers. This is the great thing about Everett. It's just this equation. There's the the question, what do you mean by an observation, is given a very specific, definite, rigorous, mechanistic answer in the many worlds interpretation. It means when a tiny system in superposition becomes entangled with the world. That's what it means. There's no mention of observation or measurement or observers or anything like that. The moon is there when you're not looking at it. I think that's a great place to close. Thank you very much.